Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you. Thanks to all of you, including Vince Power, Chris Benito, Steve Iadarola, and we got three brand new patrons. So three times the cheers for Daniel, Bruce, and Tom with an H. Welcome, Daniel, Bruce, and Tom. <laughs> On this episode of DTNS, Apple is the first to get popped under the EU's Digital Markets Act. A brain implant to cure epileptic seizures is out. And why the pivot to news video on the internet is finally happening and what that means for you. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, June 24th, 2024. 24, 24, 24 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From deep in the heart of Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer. Anthony Lemos, a.k.a. Amos. It is our pleasure and our duty at the same time to keep you up to date on the tech news so that you understand the world around you better. And I can't think of a better example of that than today's show, Justin. Uh, neither can I, Tom. Uh, never in the cosmos history have we had such stellar proof. We got medical tech. Uh, we've got uh, video on the Internet finally having its day. We've got... Mm -hmm. Apple in trouble? I, I know a lot of you don't like too much Apple coverage, but what if I told you Apple was in trouble? Are you interested then? <laughs> Perhaps. Are you not entertained? And if you do right. like Apple, it's just a precursor for the other big ones, too. Let's start with the quick hits. A fire broke out Monday morning at the Aerosel battery plant, 45 kilometers south of Seoul, killing at least 22 people. 18 Chinese, a Laotian, and two Koreans are among the dead. Aerosel held around 35,000 battery cells on its second floor, where they did the inspecting and packaging. The fire began when a series of battery cells exploded, uh, but the cause of the explosion, like why did those battery cells explode, is not known. Lithium-ion batteries can explode if they're damaged or overheated, uh, and battery materials like nickel can catch fire easily. Uh, so you can imagine scenarios, but we don't know which one was at play here. Firefighters had to use sand to put out the fire. If you didn't know, water can actually increase battery fire intensity. South Korea is a leading producer of lithium-ion batteries, so this is quite a setback. OnePlus scheduled an announcement for the OnePlus Ace 3 Pro, OnePlus Pad Pro, OnePlus Watch 2, and OnePlus Buds 3 for Thursday, June 27th in China. They'll be available for purchase in China within a few days after that. Mm, what a lovely early birthday present. Engineers at the University of Manchester in the UK have designed a robot that can jump 120 meters high. That is way farther than the current record for robot jumping, which is 33 meters. It's designed to move straight up without wasting energy by rotating or moving to the side. The design puts more of the component's mass near the top and then tapers the structure toward the bottom. The legs, which it's mostly legs, fold out into a diamond shape when preparing to jump. The next steps are to control the direction of the jump, harvest energy from landing, and that would extend the battery life, and create a more compact design that would be suitable for space exploration. The engineers published their design in the journal Mechanism and Machine Theory. Reuters reports a company called Tollbit has been marketing its services by saying companies are not respecting do not crawl instructions from websites. Business Insider goes further and says that Anthropic and OpenAI are among uh, the, the companies, but both say that they have that they respect do not crawl instructions. Meanwhile, Wired caught a crawler ignore, ignoring its do not crawl and then found its content showing up in the Perplexity AI search service. Perplexity blamed it on a third-party crawler it uses data from, and when asked if it was, has told the third party to stop, they said it's complicated. Is that their relationship status with that third party? Maybe so. Maybe Certainly so. is now. Uh, if you've been wondering why Apple intelligence couldn't run on older phones when it can go to the cloud, like why not just send the older phones all the time to the cloud if the local chip can't help it? John Gruber from Daring Fireball asked Apple and found out. Apple says that the main reason is the on-device cloud model and the cloud models are different. Uh, it's not the same thing in the cloud that you have on the device. 
and you need the on-device model to determine when to use the cloud model. So if you don't have an on-device model running, you can't figure out what the stuff in the cloud is available and, and when to use it. Uh, it's also probably true that supporting all the models all the time in the cloud would cost Apple more money. Gruber also says people are going to get tired of the permission prompts to use ChatGPT since there is no always allow option. They're going to ask you, do you want to do this every single time? Uh, speaking of Apple partners, the Wall Street Journal says Meta, Anthropic, and Perplexity are all talking to Apple about being alternative options like ChatGPT as well. All right, let's start the big news. The European Commission sent Apple a preliminary ruling that its anti-steering measures violate the Digital Markets Act. First, yay, Apple gets to say they were first because Meta and Google are also <laughs> being investigated. So this, this doesn't necessarily end here. Uh, anti-steering measures that are in violation or possibly in violation, Apple still gets to defend itself, uh, but what the EU is saying it's concerned with are the fact that Apple restricts what an app maker can say about paying for things outside of the Apple ecosystem. Apple just gives you boilerplate text and you can't promote within it. You can't say how much the discount is, anything like that. Uh, most places outside the EU, app makers can't even mention another way to pay. Uh, but here, the, the way they can mention it is restricted in a way the EU doesn't like. And in the EU, Apple allows a single link and restricts what you can say in relation to that link. Uh, so those are the anti-steering measures. The EC found that three sets of business terms violate the DMA. Uh, the fact that they can't provide pricing information uh, in, and other ways of promoting cheaper offers, uh, the, the restrictions on what the link can say and where it can lead. Basically, Apple only lets you finish the transaction on a web page. EU says you should be able to have that link go wherever you want. And Apple collects a fee on every transaction made if you link out to an alternate payment system, which the EC is fine with. They're like, yeah, you can, you can say you get to get a cut of that, but the EC thinks the fees go beyond what is strictly necessary. Apple, for example, asks for every cut of a purchase made on that at third party uh, way of paying for seven days after you click a link on an app. Uh, so not just the one that results from you clicking, but all, all your transactions you do for seven days after that. The EU says that's too much. Uh, Apple will get to defend itself, like I said, before it's found in violation. This is a preliminary decision that Apple gets to answer and say, oh, we think you got stuff wrong. Uh, if, however, the EC says, mm, we don't buy your defense, then Apple could be fined up to 10% of global annual revenue. Uh, that would be a fine in the tens of billions of dollars. Now, Apple has a lot of cash sitting around, uh, so they obviously could afford it, but they probably don't want to pay it if they don't have to. Uh, they definitely would appeal this if they end up losing the decision uh, and drag it through the courts for several years. So the consequences of this, even if the EU sticks to the preliminary accusation, are probably not going to be felt by Apple for years. Justin, what make you of Apple being the first to suffer the regulatory scrutiny of the DMA? Well, if this is like any other Apple situation, then what's probably going to happen is that exactly what you said, they're going to drag it through the courts. And then if there's some other situation that makes it more advantageous for them to just make the changes that they, uh, uh, you know, are being asked to make because of some other regulatory pressure, then they're just going to do that and, and move on and, and they will all go from there. Apple understands that when it comes to their regulatory capture of the app market on iOS, they don't have a second bite at the Apple when they relinquish control. And so there's a reason why they are being draconian. You can make the understanding, or, and when you look at the numbers that come in for them on this, this kind of stuff for app listing, you can get it, right? This is a non-insignificant source of revenue for them. And it is probably anti-competitive. <laughs> you, you should probably be allowed to say, sign up for 10% off this platform. Uh, just click here for a link. Because naturally, for the for the user, you want the convenience. You probably just want to sign up right there. And it's always been a frustrating part of the iOS ecosystem that sometimes you want to subscribe to a service and you just either don't have a button at all or 
there's an onerous link out that you know takes you to a thing that you have to go to another thing and they're asking you to remember to go log on in your browser when you get back to your desktop it's just weird and and so i i don't think that the eu as much as i love to make fun of uh, european regulations i don't think this one is totally out of pocket i i think apple is justified in being careful about what people can do on a phone uh, I think it would be justified in saying we're going to be a little stricter about installing third party apps on a phone than we are on Mac OS because more people have phones and they're used more casually than a laptop. I think Apple's overdoing it. And I think they're very clearly, I'm with you on this, overdoing it for business reasons, not for consumer experience reasons. Because as you so eloquently pointed out, this is a horrible consumer experience where you're yeah. like, I don't even know how to pay for a, for this service because Apple won't let them link out and they refuse to use the Apple system because they don't want to give 30%. Uh, and so the customer is left out. I've always felt that Apple is not prior prioritizing the user experience here uh, and they should. And so, yeah, I, I don't disagree with the EU saying, look, you can restrict what the app makers say, you can restrict where they link, but you're overdoing it. Uh, you're saying they can't say anything but this. And what you should be saying is you can't say these three things, maybe, right? Because there are bad actors who will take advantage of this and link you to malicious places. There are bad actors who will use language that uh, is, you know, going to confuse you and potentially defraud you. Those should absolutely be prohibited. That's not what Apple's doing. Apple's saying you can't say anything except these five words. It's not five, but you get my point, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think that's overdoing it. And I think the, uh, the EC. Sadly, I agree with you, Justin. That makes a boring segment, I know, but you know, <laughs> I think uh, it's over the top that the only thing Apple allows you to write under the link is this link is haunted. That's unfair. <laughs> it seems unfair. It's kidding, yeah. kidding, kidding. Not real, but yeah. By the way, uh, if you're like, wait, didn't they get fined for this already? Uh, Spotify complained about Apple's anti steering rules before they modified them for the DMA, back when they wouldn't let even a link happen. Uh, and Spotify won, and the EC fined Apple 1.8 billion euros earlier this year. Uh, Apple has appealed that, so they haven't paid that fine. That's what's going to happen in this case, too. Uh, the EC is also opening an investigation into Apple's requirement the companies pay a fee to offer an app or app store outside of the Apple App Store in Europe. Uh, again, not taking issue with the fact that they charge a fee, but whether that fee is appropriate. Let's move on to a medical tech story that I think is pretty feel good. A brain computer in interface uh, or BCI is something that allows your brain to communicate with an outside device. Now, usually we're talking about something where you're controlling a cursor, uh, you know, or being able to have someone who's paralyzed control an arm. Uh, and I don't know if this technically really qualifies as a BCI or not, but it strikes me that it's in the same ballpark. Amber Therapeutics has something called a PicoStim neurotransmitter that is helping a patient with severe epilepsy control seizures. Uh, it was implanted in October by surgeons at Great Ormond Street Hospital in London. They removed a small part of the skull from the head of a 12-year-old boy who suffers severe seizures, and they implement, implanted the PicoStim transmitter as part of Project Cadet. That's a series of trials that is trying to assess the safety and effectiveness of this kind of deep brain stimulation. The implant is 3.5 centimeters square, 0.6 centimeters thick, connects to electrodes that are implanted deep into the thalamus, and it emits a constant pulse of current that is designed to block and disrupt abnormal signals that cause seizures. So far... It has eliminated seizures where he drops to the ground, uh, the most disruptive kind, and it's made his nighttime seizures shorter and less severe, Justin. You know, this is the kind of stuff that when we get mired hip deep in cynicism and ugliness on things that the Internet can bring us, it is just nice to be able to see that not only tech but specifically hardware which is uh, i think having a a real resurgence uh but we're, we're seeing a lot of different uh, applications for really really cool hardware can affect something that is unambiguously great news yeah that, that a a child now can live a better life because of this kind of technological advancement it just makes you feel uh warm and fuzzy yeah and this is 
the deep brain stimulation part of this is not what's new. Uh, the, there have been models that do this, but they had to be implanted in the chest like a pacemaker, mm. uh, which was more risky, uh, more cause for infection, uh, and uh, harder to charge uh, and change the battery. This device, I know, I know at least one of you was like, oh, you planted it in the head, but what if the battery goes bad? What do you do then? Uh, the device recharges by wearing wireless headphones. So the patient Amazing. just listens to some music or watches TV and the battery charger is in the band of the headphones and recharges the uh, implant in the skull. It's also outward facing. So you, you can, you know, suppose it's, theoretically, I imagine, take it out and, and replace it. You could probably uh, just wear a little hat. Yeah. Yeah. And just to have it charging from the hat. Yeah. Uh, they also Top want to hat, up maybe give yourself a little <laughs> uh, room. Very, very sporty, um, yeah. very fashionable. Uh, future plans for the device include real-time adjustments as well. So that would be something that would be harder to do with the chest implant is to have it be able to monitor the brain yeah. activity at the same time that it's uh, delivering it. And then they can have not just a constant emission, but have adjusting emissions that hopefully would block more of the seizures as they are about to happen. So exactly. Yeah. yeah that's, that's the, 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 the data coming out of it is some of the most fascinating stuff. Cause, cause to understand in what real world situations, not clinical situations, but real world situations that a seizure is coming from being able to track it next to diet and uh, various other situations are, I, I think that's, that's exceptional. There there's, there's a lot of really, really, really cool stuff that can be done with this. I ask this question merely because I, again, I know one of you thought about this while listening, how many people are thinking, well, this is great and it should be used to cure epilepsy first, but could I get a battery in my head? to charge other things so that it would just it would so actually, you would always have one. Yeah. So you could, you could charge your headphones from your head. Oh yeah. You're just like, like every, Oh man, my phone's out. Don't worry, dog. I got just you. stick it hey, on my just, head, stick it hey, in my top pop hat, it, pop yeah. it right in. Yeah. Right in my bowler. And then, you know, <laughs> I, I do a little, a little, uh, a uh, uh, flip, you know, throw that the iPhone right in there. You're going to be at 20% in five minutes, dude. Now puppy kitty hat is saying, uh, uh, kitty cat, puppy kitty trout is saying, I've seen charging hats for similar tech. Uh, so this would be a way to recharge your charging hat. As well. In all, yeah. In all, in all, in all seriousness, this is amazing news. And I really, really am excited, especially for everybody who's either had a kid that suffered from it or been that kid who has suffered from it. That is, that is uh, a yeah. uh, bad, bad times. No, definitely. I first thing I thought of was my cousin uh, and and her epileptic seizures when I was a kid, and how you know how how I, I wished there was something that could help her with that, um, and and so this kind of thing is is very very promising. Uh, again, this yeah. is just a trial. It's just one person for now. You know, they got to see how it goes, but it's it's very promising. And a lot of you in our survey have been saying, you know, I want to hear more medical tech. I want to hear more of the advancements that are on the edge, even if they're not widespread and practical yet. Not just pie in the sky stuff necessarily, like the robot design. They haven't built that yet, but, but like this, where it's like, oh, you're actually put this in a human being and it seems to be working. So look for more of that in the show these days. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you want deep dives, if you want more in-depth discussion of tech topics, you might want to check out Know a Little More. Uh, patrons get it as part of their patronage of DTNS, uh, but you can also support it directly at its own Patreon or at knowalittlemore.com. Uh, our latest episode is the first in a series about Xerox Park. You may have heard all about Xerox Park and have all kinds of misunderstandings about who stole what from whom, but we dive into who actually worked there, what they worked on, what they developed, and what later devices, not just Apple and Microsoft, they informed. So check that out starting right now at knowalittlemore.com. The Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism issued its digital news report for 2024 last week. Neiman Labs' Nick Newman has an analysis out titled, Is the News Industry Ready for Another Pivot to Video? Uh, the study aggregated data from 47 countries showing that all the growth in platform news use coming from video or video-led networks. Now, platform news use means uh, not on the publisher's website, but on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, etc. You may say, oh, wait, didn't Facebook try to get everybody to do news video? They did. It didn't really pan out. 
YouTube has done this several times to varying levels of effectiveness, if any effectiveness at all. Uh, this time it's happening because the audience would like to watch news video and they're not watching it on Facebook. Growth in news use is coming from YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram. Now, Facebook is still the highest percentage, but it's going down, 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 and down while you're seeing YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram news usage go up, 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 and up. Uh, and with Instagram, it's video. With TikTok and YouTube, it's obviously video. Growth is fastest, of course, in the younger demos. You might guess that. Uh, it's also faster outside the US and Europe than it is inside. YouTube is used for news by 31% of the sample, but in India, it's 51%, and in Kenya, it's 59%. TikTok is growing. It's still small, but it's growing. It hit 13%, but that puts it ahead of X, which only has 10%. And again, TikTok's usage is powered in part by rising news use on TikTok in the global south. Newman came up with three reasons why he thinks respondents are attracted to video news on these social platforms. I'm going to run them by you, Justin, uh, mm -hmm. and I want to know what you think. Number one, people say they like that it's unfiltered and therefore perceived as trustworthy. In other words, instead of a vetted journalist, there's someone I've never seen before telling me. No, 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 it's not that. It's the bystander <laughs> thing. It's the like, oh, I saw the actual video of the thing happening, yeah. not just a reporter talking about it. Uh, number two, convenience. The news comes up in your feed and is of interest to you because the platform knows the kinds of things you're interested in. And number three, different perspectives in depth. This is the like, yeah, I get the same perspective from a lot of the mainstream publishers, but I get all these different perspectives and I get more in-depth looks at them sometimes from TikTok, YouTube, and Instagram. 72% of video news consumption comes from platforms. 72%, not from publishers. 22% of video news cons consumption comes from platform or comes from publishers. So Justin, where do you think this is coming from? Like the audience is pivoting to video, uh, not because someone told them to. Uh, and what effect do you think this has on news publishing? Well, the audience is not pivoting to anywhere. The audience is new. <laughs> the audience are are people for whom are native internet users that didn't know there was a world in which these brands used to exist before they started putting stuff up. And you have an entirely new generation of people that are very fascinated in disseminating certain kinds of news for their peers, but don't want to go to a school to learn how to do it, don't want to pursue a career, oftentimes have other careers and are kind of doing it as a hobby so they can gain clout amongst the community that they are on. The question for publishers is, what's the gain here? Mm -hmm. Why do you want to dedicate time, effort, and resources to create content that is specifically within the realm of those platforms? Instagram and TikTok, uh, YouTube Shorts, they're all similar. There are differences between each platform. But if you are making short-form content, the question is why? And then the ultimate bedeviling question is what do we get out of it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh it's, it's a tough question, though, because on the one hand, the answer could and should be, uh, this is not your domain, don't do it. But the temptation is, well, if we don't go there, then we lose out and people stop coming to our platform because they want to get their news from TikTok, YouTube, etc. Here is an interesting outlier from this survey. Norway had 45% of its audience going to publishers, and that was the highest percentage because they have strong, trusted brands. Uh, so that's one thing. People don't trust a lot of the news brands out there anymore, but in Norway, apparently they do. And I thought this was a bigger reason and possibly why they are a trusted brand, a good user experience. These publishers do not post to online platforms. If you want the Norwegian news sources, you got to go to their website. You got to go to their app. Uh, and people want to because it's a good user experience. They're not embattling their, their users by putting paywalls in front of them all the time, only where it makes sense, makes it easy for people to find the stuff they want. And when they do pay for it, they feel like they're getting a satisfactory amount of value for their subscription price. Maybe there's a prescription available there. Yes, and uh, uh, trust me, it, 
if I had a a dime for each year that I have yelled uh, either two people specifically involved or just into the sky that these brands that matter to me uh, should be more internet friendly, then I'd have, I don't know, enough dimes since 2005. <laughs> you have a lot, March of dimes, you might even I'd say. have, yeah, I'd have, I'd have whatever, do the math, 19 dimes. Uh, the problem with news is, and here, here's what happens with Facebook, and Facebook specifically is the scar that is left on the news industry, specifically the newspaper industry, when it comes to this. Facebook went to these big brands, New York Times, Washington Post, and said, here's a bunch of money. Hire a bunch of people. Start making videos. Uh, then Facebook said, oh, these are performing terribly. We're not paying you money anymore. And then all of a sudden, these overgrown staffs had to be dealt with. There's, it's not to say that there's not a room for it, and you should be able to come back to your platform and subscribe. No matter what, the, Ameri the model of American journalism, especially in the big national brand age, they do not derive their main money from subscriptions. They derive their main money from some other element of either advertising or direct-to-consumer uh, uh, products like classifieds. That, that's what it was back in the day. Now... They don't know what it is. And until they figure that out, then either we need to return to a more regional focus or these national brands are just going to crash and burn no matter where they put their video. I, I don't know. I, th I think because we're talking TV here with video versus newspaper, I guess the carrier fee, right, is the version that, of the classified. Uh, and you're going to have to convince someone why your news is worth paying for by providing a really compelling experience. Treat yourself like any other app and show people like, hey, if you come to our experience, you get more informed, you get better quality, you get substantive news, you feel like you understand things better. I feel like maybe I, that's what the Norway publishers are doing better than other publishers, which is why they still have a better retention. Or maybe it's just a quirk of Norway and its culture. Uh, it's hard to say. Yeah. Look, one last thing on this. Uh, everybody does video now. I mean, yes, when, when you talk about the carriage fees, that is certainly something. And I can you can make the argument that if your network has a very good reputation, then that's what you need to do because you're essentially now the future of this are these online bundles where – uh, uh, paying for a very curated, more curated than they were before list of channels is something that you want to get people over the paywall for if you're YouTube TV or anything like this. So, uh, uh, yeah, brand brand value matters more in that category. Yeah. Or maybe there's something with Apple News or any of Google News or any of these other platforms don't, that don't are Don't fall for it. Don't fall for it, news organizations. They will not save you. Save yourselves. <laughs> save yourselves. Well, Justin, uh, thank you for saving us uh, your insights for today's show. Uh, where else can people go to find other of your insights? So many firsts this week. The first presidential debate in June. The first presidential debate where both contestants are over the age of 78. And the first between two people who have been president. And I'm going to be covering all of it on Politics, Politics, Politics. Find it. Uh, not only wherever you find your podcast, but also on YouTube. I've pivoted to video as well. YouTube.com slash at politics, politics. Well, now we know why the audience is pivoting to video. It's because Justin's there. There you I go. Finally we, I finally we're did it. We're also there. I don't, we don't ever talk about it, but twitch.tv no. slash good day internet, youtube.com slash daily tech news show. Uh, we do mention the TikTok channel from time to time. Go check mm -hmm. all of them out. Yeah. Patrons, uh, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. Uh, we are going to take a longer look at one of the stories of the day. And this one is puzzling both of us. Amazon Prime streamed Kendrick Lamar's concert from Los Angeles on Wednesday at the Fabulous Forum, in which he played his Drake diss track, Not Like Us, for the first time on stage, five times, as a matter of fact. Uh, and it was very buzzy. People were talking about it. They were talking about it not because they were there, although some people were, but because they were watching the stream online. When Taylor Swift's Eras Tour streamed online, everybody talked about the numbers that it got. Why is there no talk of the streaming numbers for Kendrick Lamar's concert? We're going to talk about that on Good Day Internet. Stick around.
You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow, everybody. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>